So Richard Dawkins is the Charles Simoni Professor for the Public Understanding of Science at the University of Oxford, and the author most currently of The God Delusion. Well, I've been called out. I, I hadn't prepared anything. Um, Dan Dennett uh, has a phrase, belief in belief. Dan, as you know, is not here because he's been, as was thought, mortally ill, and, and th thank goodness, in his own words, um, he's pulled through. Um, one of the more memorable phrases of his book, Breaking the Spell, is this thing, belief in belief. There are many people who don't actually believe in religion, but who believe in belief in religion in the sense that they, they get a nice, warm, fuzzy, glowy feeling when they come across religion. They think it's a good idea for other people to be religious, although, of course, we're much too intelligent to be religious ourselves. But nevertheless, it's a good idea that there is religion around. And I wondered whether Steven Weinberg, who, who is a man I enormously respect and who is one of the staunchest atheists on the planet, was feeling the need to bend over backwards and be just a little bit nice about religion, scrape the barrel to find something nice to say about religion. And so he, we came up with this picture of the elderly aunt um, who has, who we, we, we'll, we'll all miss her when she goes. I won't miss her at all. Not one scrap, not one smidgen. I am... utterly fed up with the respect that we all of us, including the secular among us, have been brainwashed into um, bestowing upon religion. I'm coming on to what Joan Roughgarden said in a moment. Um, what would we miss? Would we miss the music? Would we miss the, the poetry? Well, yes, we would. We would miss the music. The B minor mass, the Matthew Passion, these happen to be on a religious theme, but they might as well not be. They're beautiful music on a great poetic theme, but we could still go on enjoying them without believing in any of that supernatural rubbish. When I did Desert Island Discs, which was, which is the, um, which is a program on British radio where you have to go on and. Um, name the half dozen, I forget how many it is, six records, I think, um, that you would take to a desert island. Um, I chose uh, Mache dich mein Herz rein from the Matthew Passion. It's the most beautiful, gorgeous piece of music. And the question mistress, Sue Lawley, couldn't understand how I could possibly choose a religious piece of music. You might as well say, how can you enjoy Wuthering Heights when you know perfectly well that Cathy and Heathcliff never really existed? It's fiction. It's good fiction. It's moving fiction. But it's still fiction. So I think there is an awful lot of bending over backwards to be nice to religion going on. Even Steven Weinberg uh, indulged in it a certain amount today. But... When we've lost religion, as I hope one day we shall, we shall have lost the appalling guilt that afflicts people brainwashed as children into being religious. Um, we shall have lost the, uh, the brainwashing of children, which, which indeed labels them as, being, as, belonging, as, as sharing the same religious opinions as their parents, a form of child abuse. Uh, we shall have lost the subversion of science which comes from teaching children that faith is a virtue. Faith meaning belief without evidence. Children are systematically taught that there is a higher kind of knowledge which comes from faith, which comes from revelation, which comes from scripture, which comes from tradition, and it's the equal if not the superior of knowledge that comes from real evidence. Now, Joan Roughgarden has offered what I would call a poetic vision of science, um, which I think I would call po poetic, although I think it's rather bad poetry. 
trying to woo people of religion over to evolution by seeking out passages in the Bible which have some faint, vague, tenuous connection to evolution, the, the kind that were speckled and brown, the, the mustard seed, or the, in, in not the Bible, but in the, um, the, the, the Christian communion service, the, 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 the wafer as being in some poetic sense symbolic of um, St. Paul's view that we are all of one body. Why bother to express truths, if they are truths, why bother to make up a parable, to make up this tenuous allegory when you can just tell people the truth? The truth is perfectly simple. Why bother with going back to the Bible and seeking out some sort of uh, analogy? Why not just teach natural selection, teach evolution the way it is? It's perfectly simple. You don't need to this strained, unnatural seizing of a possible analogy from the Bible. It would be almost as though Crick and Watson's DNA structure were one day discovered to be false, and we all admit that science moves on, and maybe it would, this particular one I think won't be, but suppose that the double helix turns out not to be true. The sort of religious parable, the sort of re religious allegorical thinking that we've had an exhibition of this afternoon would be similar to a, a scientist of, of the future saying something like this. Well, of course, we don't literally believe in the double helix anymore, but let's think, what does the double helix have to tell us today? I mean, the, the intertwining of the two strands is symbolic of the uh, I don't know, human love or something of that sort. The, the purines and pyrimidines cross-linking um, has some other symbolic, allegorical significance. Why bother with that kind of thing? It seems to me to be absolutely typical of what's wrong with the religious mind. Of course, I'm not now talking about the, the, the fundies who, who really do enter into science and simply get it wrong. I'm talking about the sophisticated theologians who probably don't actually believe any of it, or if they do, they hardly do. But they nevertheless keep it going by means of this sort of bogus, poetic, symbolic way of, of talking. When we, we actually understand, we're, we're getting to the point when we understand the reality of the world. And then the thing about conflict and cooperation, cooperation rather than, than conflict, um, sexual relations as deception or cooperative, um, the locker room bravado. I really don't think it does science any service at all to drag in human emotive phrases like locker room bravado. If the current theory of sexual selection is wrong, then by all means expose it as wrong on scientific grounds, but not on emotional, quasi-poetic grounds. Well, I'm sorry, that was a bit of a rant, but I, I was unprepared, and I'm just reacting immediately to what I've just, just heard. Thank you.